good to see everybody. Since the visitors have been welcomed, I won't do that. And uh, also, I think it's a little futile at times because men get up here and they say, oh, there's men in the audience that are more capable than, than me. And so I won't say that either. And so we want to continue our worship. The Christmas story, we, we like Christmas. We, that's once a year. It's probably often enough. <laughs> I don't know if we could handle a twice a year Christmas or not. But uh, we like Christmas and what it means, family, uh, getting together, uh, gift giving. I don't know how much people do. Uh, we don't do that a whole lot. We haven't over the years. Uh, that's kind of uh, part of it. But we know the Christmas story, and uh, at the uh, school program last Sunday night, uh, the emphasis was on the greatest gift that was ever given, and it was. It was Jesus being the greatest gift of all. And so we talk about the great story of Christmas, uh, and so I want to continue that uh, this morning. Uh, maybe a little different angle of it. Uh, I, I was thinking of naming the message the end of Christmas, but I, but Christmas never ends, okay? So I scrapped that uh, because Christmas never ends. Uh, it has a beginning, but there's never an ending. And so I uh, just, the message, I just named it the greatest message of Christmas not necessarily the end of the greatest message of Christmas. And I'm going to Luke 24, uh, reading from there. Um, Luke, Luke 2 is the beginning of the story. And uh, Luke 24 it kind of brings, as far as the actual presence of Jesus on this earth, is over. Uh, and so we will we'll read that and uh, we'll see that. Uh, greatest message of Christmas. And I'm Luke 24, verses 36 to 53. And just prior to that, Jesus was on the road to Emmaus, uh, and he revealed himself uh, to those that, two disciples that were walking on there. And this is just after that. Uh, and as they, and these disciples went back to Jerusalem and were gathered together again. In verse 36, And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do your thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for the spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb. And he took it and ate it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the, in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to raise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name or proclaimed, proclaimed in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of those things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but ye tarry, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued from power on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them, from them and carried into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. So this morning, the greatest message of uh, Christmas is repentance and the remission of sins. That's why Jesus came. 
And so that's the greatest message uh, of Christmas. And we notice that Jesus said that all things, what were written in the law, in the prophets, and in the Psalms, actually in the Psalm, must be fulfilled. And, and they were all fulfilled. We know that, that uh, they were fulfilled. I was kind of, uh, before we get into some of these others, I was just kind of impressed with, uh, in verse 36, when Jesus stood in their midst, we can see the reaction of the disciples. It says they were afraid. They were frightened. They thought they had saw a ghost uh, spirit uh, when Jesus appeared. And he said, why are you troubled? This is just me. I, I, this is Jesus. I, why are you afraid? Why? A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones like I do. And uh, then if you go to verse 45, and I think this is uh, significant. He, it says he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And I think, this is just my thinking, but I'm thinking that at that point they received uh, the remission of sins, that they totally understood the gospel. Because later on it says that they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and they praising and blessing God. So something changed. I think it changed in verse 45. The greatest message of Christmas is that repentance and remission of sins, uh, Jesus said, should be preached or proclaimed in his name all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Uh, the message of repentance and remission of sins is the first message of Jesus. And we say, we always say, first things first, all right? Right here it is. This is first things first. This is, this is it. This is right here. I like to go... In the Old Testament, it's a little bit different in the Old Testament as far as repentance. Uh, I did not do this study, I, and I don't know for sure if repentance is, word is actually in the Old Testament. Maybe it is. It could be. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, but when God, through the law, we know the law was in effect in the Old Testament. And... Uh, God's people strayed many times, walked away, turned their backs on God, and God, through his prophets, many, many times uh, challenged the people to, to uh, repent. I'm just going to read uh, a couple mm -hmm. verses, uh, and I think you'll notice uh, a couple of words that are pretty much in every one of these verses that what God wants them to do. Okay, and starting way in Deuteronomy already, way back at the beginning, uh, God was already talking to them. And he said, Thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord and do all the commandments which I command thee this day. Uh, another verse is, Thou shalt return to the Lord thy God and thou shalt obey. Oh, I read that one. Okay, the, verse, the second one is almost identical. Uh, even jumping clear to Nehemiah, if you will, if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though, though they were in you, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost parts of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place where I have chosen to set my name. Job twenty-two twenty-three. 23, if thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up Thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. In Isaiah, the remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. Isaiah, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Jeremiah, if thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me, 
if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of thy sight, then shalt thou not be removed. Turn again now, every one from his evil way and from the evil of your doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord hath given you and to your fathers forever and ever. Ezekiel says, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent. There it is. I'm sorry. It actually is in the Old Testament. Repent and turn yourselves from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. Ezekiel goes on to say, If the wicked shall turn from all his sins that he hath committed and keep my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. Verse 30, repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Malachi, return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. A couple words there that you recognize what God was asking them to do. Turn or return. That was in essence, repenting in the Old Testament. That was turning back. Turn or return just meant turning around and going the opposite direction. And that's what we say repentance is. It's going the opposite direction. Now, uh, we also know in the Old Testament that sins can would were never forgiven. If you look... Uh, I'm going to read some scripture out of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews 10, when we think of forgiveness and that uh, the sins of the Old Testament were never forgiven. They were remembered from year to year. When you think of the, the high priest entering in, into the holiest of holies once a year with blood to make a remembrance of sins, but sins were never blotted out. Hebrews 10, uh, it talks about that. For the law having a shadow of things to come and not the very image of things can never with those sacrifices which are offered year by year continually make the commerce thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be up offered? If they could have been made perfect, then the offerings would have ceased but they never were. Because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sin, and that is something that could not be taken away. If, it, if those offerings, the shedding of blood could have, then our conscience would have been cleansed. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance made again of those sins every year. For it's not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. Wherefore, he cometh when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. Um, going on down to uh, like verse 10. By the which will we are in sanctified to the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every high priest standing daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin, sat down on the right hand of God forever. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected for them forever them that are sanctified. And there we have it. That's what should bring joy to us. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. This is just totally different with Jesus coming. And so... Uh, and then he says later, their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering of sin. There's no need for any more offering of sin. It's done. It's over. And it's for us today.
that was the setting of the Old Testament. And I had to think of how would that be living in that time when every year remembrance is made of sin, but you can never be forgiven of those sins. They, they're just were with you. But when you return to God the way he said, uh, and we talked about Joseph being a just man, that, that, was, that was him. He followed the law, and that was counted to them as righteousness. We, we have many Old Testament people that do that. The message of repentance and remission of sins is a foundational message. Jesus didn't say we should preach anything else. But we do. We preach all kinds. We have, all, we have the whole Bible. I know. I understand. We preach all kinds of things. But the message of uh, repentance and remission of sin is so foundational. We can preach all kinds of other messages unless we have experienced that. Even a message of love and of hope and encouragement also, to me, will be of very little value if you don't have that foundation first. And that's why Jesus said that that needs to be preached in all nations beginning at Jerusalem. First test in the New Testament, uh, we have a couple of scriptures. Uh, Matthew 3, and uh, this is um, chapter 3. Uh, verses 2, this is John the Baptist. He says, he started preaching, and he said, Repent ye, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Uh, going in chapter 4, verses 15 through 17, and this is Jesus. Uh, Jesus began his ministry, and he says in verse uh, 16, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region of shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was the very first sermon of Jesus, repent. And that's what he instructed his disciples to do um, in the beginning of their ministry. There is no message to me as important as the message of repentance and remission of sin. To make this message effective in my own life means that I have to experience that. If I don't experience the uh, message of repentance and remission of sins, I, I don't have a foundation to receive anything else. And I think in verse 45, when you talk about the apostles, the apostles understood that from that point on, that repentance. All other messages to me need to be preached on the foundation of repentance and remission of sin. Last Sunday, Junior mentioned a, a, a preacher that said in a mega church that he doesn't preach sin to his people because they know they're sinners. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. He just preaches hope and encouragement, all that. That's backwards. I, I don't I, that. If you can't receive those kind of things the way God wants us to receive unless we have experienced, unless people recognize that they're sinners, and they need salvation, and they need to repent. All these others are good, and we need them. Repenting and returning by the remission of sins is just an acknowledging that we're sinners. We sin, and we do. Repenting is hard for, some, for people at times. It, it's acknowledging that I erred, and that kind of goes against the flesh. We, we don't like to do, you know, uh, but Jesus said that's the only way, that there is no other way, is to repent and acknowledge that we have sin. Where there is no confession of sin, there is no remission of sin. If I don't confess my sin, I don't have 
the forgiveness of sin. That has to be first. We have to acknowledge. There are many other gospels out there, and we know that. We've heard them. We have a uh, feel-good gospel, you know, pastors that want to make their people feel really good, don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. Uh, we have the once saved, always saved, and we know that's not scriptural. Uh, we have gospels that just say, follow your heart. Well, that's kind of could be dangerous at times, and, and if we don't have the foundation before that, that uh, is not a good. Uh, we have a gospel where it says that we have a right to be comfortable. We have a right to be comfortable. I'm not sure about that. Uh, I don't read anywhere that Jesus proclaimed a gospel of being comfortable. Gospel or the message of repentance. Mission sin is the greatest message of Christmas. Going into the New Testament, just reading some verses here in closing. Uh, Luke 3.13, Jesus said, uh, when they were talking about in Galilee that uh, <clears throat> a tower fell down and Someone asked if these were sinners above the rest of the people, and Jesus said, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. So that's what Jesus said. Acts 3.19, this is the apostles preaching, Repent thee therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And that, to me, is key verse right there. Uh, our response and God's response. Acts 17.30, uh, Paul said that the times of this ignorance God winked at when we were ignorant of salvation. Uh, but he's saying, now he has commanded all men everywhere to repent. And so that's uh, what we need today. Acts 2.38, Peter getting up after the scene of the Pentecost and the giving of the Spirit. Uh, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So we're saying first things first. Repenting, remission of sins needs to happen before I can receive the Holy Spirit. That's what he says. And that's a need for us today. Our world, the need of repenting and experiencing the remission of our sins. The greatest person of the greatest story has brought to us the greatest message of Christmas. And that is of repentance and remission of sins. And that's our responsibility to spread that word. Shall we pray? Thank you, Lord, so much for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for Christmas, what it means to us, and what it brings to us. Thank you, Lord, for the fulfillment of your word to your son, Jesus, and that he came in the fullness of time to bring salvation. And you're teaching to us that of the need of repentance and having the remission of sins for our lives. And we know, Lord, that's a daily thing for most of us, if not all of us. But we are in this body, and that we have a tendency to lose sight of you, and we commit sin at times. And we need to constantly be aware of that condition and to repent and apply the blood to our sins and to our short and our failures. So we thank you, Lord, for your message to us, and we thank you for caring about us, for your love, and for all you do for us and providing for us. So we thank you for this time and just reminding us of your great love to us through Jesus. And we pray in Jesus' name.
Amen.